It's my great pleasure again to start the third day of our uh, series, liver imaging series. And we have, as we mentioned, we have great lineup of speakers. And, and we have today, we have a very um, outstanding speaker, Dr. Fowler. So, Katie Fowler. So Katie is an associate professor of radiology in the University of California, San Diego. Uh, uh, Dr. Fowler was uh, like trained in Washington University in St. Louis, in Mellencroft Institute of Radiology. You know, that's where I started to, to Dr. Fowler, right? But I'm much older. <laughs> she was on faculty there for about eight years and then has recently moved it to UCSD to help Dr. Serlin uh, direct the liver imaging group there. I'm sure also to enjoy the beach and hiking and all of that stuff. This is not written in the bio. She is currently the, uh, she's been a long time member of LIRADS and currently serves as the co-chair of two working groups, which is management and hepatobiliary contrast agent. She's an active member of the steering committee of LIRADS and the writing committee. And um, a very uh, interesting thing, you know, uh, I have to tell you this interesting story because the other day, one of my friends told me, you know, did you see my, what your friend did do to me? I said, what, so who's friend? First of all, I don't think I have any friends. I don't think anyone likes me. And second of all, uh, you know, tell me, you know, what, what is my friend, who's my friend and what did this friend do to you? He said, your friend, Katie Fowler. I said, okay, but Katie Fowler is a very nice person. I don't expect her to do anything bad to anyone. So he said, no, she rejected my paper <laughs> in radiology. So, so Katie, it seems that you are not going to have a uh, big number of friends from your role as deputy editor of GI Imaging for Radiology. I'm going to ask you how much percentage of papers you accept because I think it's it could be less than 10%. So Katie is like, uh, despite of this, uh, you know, her young age, I think she likes to hear that. Uh, she's very accomplished and she's already the deputy editor of GI Imaging for Radiology and which is a very prestigious uh, role. And uh, without further ado, I think uh, we should start now. Katie is going to talk about malignant lesions that are definitely HSCC, which is LRM category. So, Katie. All right. I'm going to so make you the presenter in a second. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I make a lot of friends uh, in my role <laughs> for radiology. It's mostly rejection. Sorry, guys. Uh, so how uh, you know what's the percentage of your acceptance? Oh boy, um, it's very very low. You know, for GI papers, definitely you know on the order of ten percent. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. El Sayez, Khalid, friend. I think you have a lot of friends, Khalid. <laughs> Look at how many of your friends <laughs> like this. Um, you know, so many friends that you had to buy membership uh, to to provide this. So I think you know that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Okay, so I want to talk today with everybody about Labs M, and this is uh, just a quick financial disclosure slide. And then I want to make you aware, I think uh, you've heard this already, but uh, we're just going to scratch the surface of this topic today. Uh, and everyone who speaks, considering that we're only going to be talking to you for about a half an hour, is just gonna scratch the surface. So I want to draw your attention to the fact that there are so many free materials and all you have to do, you can scan this um, code or you can go to Google and type in ACR LIRADS and there you're gonna find all of the content uh, in much more detail uh, than what we're gonna be able to provide. And it even has areas for things like frequently asked questions. So some of the things that maybe you don't get a chance to, to ask today, uh, that's a good okay. reason. Okay, so here's our first case for you to consider. I've added an arrow to point out a lesion or an observation, if you will. And this observation is in a cirrhotic liver, as you can tell. And we have a non-contrast, an arterial phase, and sort of a delayed phase image. 
And I want you to kind of keep track of what this lesion is doing over time. And we're gonna think about that. And the question is, is this an HCC? Because keep in mind, that's always the question. When they ask us to image these cirrhotic patients, is there an HCC? If there's an observation, is it an HCC? Here's another case for you to consider. Non-contrast, arterial phase, portal venous, and delayed phase. And you'll see here what this lesion is doing or this observation is doing over time. So let's talk about how do we approach this. Uh, if you're new to radiology, if you're a relatively uh, early trainee, this might seem very intimidating. How can you ever come up with a differential diagnosis and get it right? Well, we have a system in place that helps us to do that, and that is LIRADS, the Liver Imaging Reporting and Data System. LIRADS has four clinical contexts that we can consider. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the CT and MR uh, diagnostic algorithm. And that's how we're gonna approach lesions such as the two that I just showed you. So as you heard yesterday, I just wanna give you a brief overview um, to kind of to recap and remind you of what Dr. Cherniak talked about yesterday. And that is, what is LIRADS and, and why are we doing it? So we're doing it in the United States uh, in the context of liver transplantation. Uh, and in that context, we want to have a very specific diagnosis. So why do we want a specific diagnosis? It's because in patients who are transplant candidates, if they have T2 stage HCC, they can be granted access uh, to organs faster or sooner than patients without HCC. So they get what's called priority on the allocation list. And this priority comes in the form of what are called MELD exception points. And these are granted on the basis of imaging diagnosis alone. So you can imagine that imaging diagnosis, that T2 stage is very, very important to get right. We really don't wanna have false positives. So we're trying to achieve a specific diagnosis. How do we do that? We're gonna apply LIRADS only in the right patients. As Dr. Cherniak mentioned yesterday, we're looking for patients that have a high pretest probability so that on the post-test assessment, we can have a greater than 95% uh, positive predictive value for that diagnosis. We're gonna not apply LIRADS in children. It just hasn't been validated. We're not gonna apply it in patients with a vascular etiology for their cirrhosis, cardiac disease, or congenital hepatic fibrosis. All of these lead to lesions that can mimic HCC that effectively reduce our ability to have a high PPV or specificity. We're gonna make sure we have our multi-phase imaging that's relatively artifact free. We're going to exclude advanced disease and you're gonna hear more about this tomorrow. How do you make that diagnosis of unequivocal enhancing tissue in vessel? And that's gonna be discussed by Dr. Furlan, the TIV category. We're gonna exclude benign lesions and this is due to pre-existing knowledge on our part of what cysts, hemangiomas look like, focal fat, perfusion abnormalities. As you, uh, your questions elucidated a little bit yesterday, uh, you point out it can be challenging to sometimes make these uh, diagnoses of cirrhotic nodules. So these are things that don't have major or ancillary features of malignancy. We're going to think about when we see something that's malignant, could it be something other than HCC? Of course, we're gonna come back to this as we discuss today. Finally, we're gonna make it to the bottom of this table, the bottom of this algorithm. And here we're left with hopefully solid hepatocellular nodules to which we're going to apply stringent criteria to come up with that diagnosis of definite HCC. For that, we go to our diagnostic table and we apply the numbers of major features and whether or not there's non-rim AFI, no AFI, and then based on size, we'll come up with it being an yep. LR3, which would be an intermediate probability of malignancy, an LR4, a probable HCC, or an LR5, a definite HCC. So with that in mind, let's look at these cases again. We are going to look at the way that this enhances, and I think that we can all agree that I'm not showing you a case of TIV. You certainly have all phases to consider here, so it's not an LRNC, not categorizable. It doesn't look benign. I hope that we don't think this is peripheral interrupted puddling of a hemangioma. So we've gotten past those three points in the algorithm, but here's where we stop. Because what we're seeing, you'll learn, is something called targetoid 
dynamic enhancement pattern. So this is the LRM category. So notice we did not get down to the diagnostic table because we recognized that this has targetoid appearance. So let's break this down a little bit. We're dealing with rim AFI, and this is a very important early point, is to differentiate rim from non-rim AFI. Rim AFI is an LRM feature, non-rim AFI is LR5. So what is LRM? These are probably or definitely malignant, but they don't have features specific for HCC. So here we're looking for lesions that have a targetoid dynamic enhancement pattern. We're gonna go into these in more detail, a targetoid appearance on diffusion or a targetoid appearance on hepatobiliary phase. So these are the target. So LRM, as I mentioned, but maybe you didn't hear me, these are going to be probably or definitely malignant lesions, but not specific for HCC. And the criteria we're going to apply are the targetoid dynamic enhancement pattern or targetoid appearance on diffusion or hepatobiliary phase. We have non-targetoid features as well that can be applied to lesions that do not meet TIV or LR5 criteria. And these include infiltrative appearance, marked diffusion restriction, necrosis or severe ischemia, and then we leave some discretion to the radiologist here, other features suggesting non-HCC malignancy. And we'll go over all of this in more detail in the coming slides. Just to give you a little bit of background, LRM was first introduced in the early versions of LIRADS. In 2013 and earlier, it was called LROM with the idea that it's other malignancy. In 2014, this was shortened to LRM and given the designation of malignancy, not specific for HCC. In 2017, we came up with some specific uh, criteria for LRM. In 2018, we really didn't change anything with regards to the LRM category. So if you're going to be looking at the literature, anything pretty much from 2017 forward would be using these specific LRM criteria that we're talking about. LRM, as we found out just a moment ago, happens early in the algorithm. So we're going to be assessing the LRM features before we get to the diagnostic table. The specific features should be applied. So right off the bat, you're gonna be looking at dynamic features uh, such as targetoid, and you're gonna be questioning in your mind, is there rim AFI? Is there peripheral washout? Is there central delayed enhancement? If any of these features are present, this lesion is designated LRM. Any of those features, even individually, they don't all have to be together, are sufficient for an LRM categorization. What if you're not sure? So LIRADS takes into account uncertainty because that's basically what we are doing as diagnostic radiologists. We're balancing degrees of uncertainty to provide what we think is the best diagnosis, but also oftentimes we're providing a differential diagnosis. When it comes to LR5, we want you to be 100% certain. So if you're gonna call something an LR5, we don't want you to say, well, it could also be something else. No, we actually want the LR5 to have no differential diagnosis. That is a stick the landing, 100% HCC, bet your house. So when you're faced with uncertainty, where you're sort of balancing, could this be a five or a four? Could this be an M or a five? You're going to tie break away from LR5, right? That's to protect the specificity of diagnosis of LR5. So when in doubt, couple ways to handle it. You could let pathology figure it out. So LRM oftentimes are going to be biopsied um, just to establish a diagnosis. So if you're unsure if something is a definite HCC versus potentially a non-HCC malignancy, the best way would be to call it an LRM and potentially have a multidisciplinary discussion where something like a biopsy might be considered. So let's break down some of these features. Targetoid dynamic enhancement. Targetoid really just means target-like. So target-like, we're looking for sort of a concentric appearance. So we want peripheral or rim arterial phase hyperenhancement, peripheral washout, 
and central delayed enhancement. So rim AFI is one of the features of the targetoid dynamic enhancement pattern. And as I mentioned before, you want to differentiate rim AFI from non-rim AFI. Rim AFI happens in the periphery of the lesion. Non-rim AFI tends to be more confluent, central arterial phase hyper enhancement relative to the background liver. Non-rim AFI is an LR5 feature. Rim AFI is an LRM feature. Peripheral washout. That's washout that's most apparent in the periphery of the observation, such as is demonstrated here. You see how this is darker than the background liver, and the center of the lesion is brighter. So this is really prescribed to the outside or the periphery of the lesion. Central delayed enhancement. You see the center of this mass is actually accumulating contrast over time. So that's a nice example of what's happening in this lesion that I showed you at the very beginning. Here we have some enhancement, which you might be on the fence, could be rim AFI, but there's no doubt what's happening with this lesion. This lesion is not washing out. This lesion is actually accumulating more contrast as time goes on. This would be a delayed central enhancement feature sufficient for LRM. Here are a couple of examples that are pulled directly from the manual. So this material is all available. There are imaging examples uh, to help explain some of these features. Here's an example on CT. So here's some rim AFI. And then over time, there's progressive enhancement within the center. This lesion is kind of filling in. This dark area is becoming smaller over time. A couple of examples here, or actually one example, a big lesion with areas of rim AFI. Notice it's not the entire lesion. Some of it maybe has non-rim AFI, but there are areas, so it can be in whole or in part. And then if we look over time, there's this beautiful area here of peripheral washout and delayed central enhancement, right? So the whole lesion doesn't have to display it, but you have regions of this lesion that are displaying these targetoid features. This would be an LRM. Some more examples, again, in whole or in part. Rim AFI, and if we look at what's happening to this part of the lesion, it's progressively enhancing over time. Some peripheral washout here. This lesion is accumulating contrast over time. I already showed you this guy, almost looks like a three-leaf clover here. Nice peripheral washout, LRM features. So we've kind of hammered home these dynamic contrast enhanced uh, pattern of targetoid appearance. But now let's talk, because this also applies to restriction in diffusion and hepatobiliary phase images. So targetoid pattern on diffusion, you're looking for the periphery of the lesion to have more restricted diffusion than the center. So what does that look like? That will be a bright rim on the high B value DWI or a dark rim on the ADC. Here are just a couple more examples. This ADC map nicely shows the dark rim. Here's a high B-value diffusion showing peripheral bright signal. Here's another example where you actually don't appreciate on the B-value, but when you look at the ADC, you nicely see that this actually does have a targetoid appearance on diffusion. How about hepatobiliary phase? We're looking for a concentric pattern where there's moderate to marked hypo intensity throughout, but that there's a periphery here that's darker than the center. People have described this as cloud-like retention, mild central retention. Uh, this has been reported in the literature in many examples of non-HCC malignancies. You could see kind of a variable appearance. Here's kind of a little dot. This one has kind of that dark rim, almost looks like peripheral washout, but this is a patibiliary phase. We don't assess washout during this phase. This is more of a factor of retention of contrast. So why does this contrast pool in the middle of these lesions? Is it because these lesions have hepatocytes? The answer is no. We expect that these lesions, in fact, do not have normal hepatocytes. The contrast pooling uh, may be due, so this is a guess, may be due to sort of a third spacing or a trapping within the extracellular matrix of these lesions. Uh, cholangiocarcinomas and other non-HCC malignancies tend to have a lot of fibrous stroma or desmoplastic stroma where you have a lot of um, collagen and fibrosis that can trap 
the contrast. So it just isn't leaking out from the center of these lesions. This phenomenon can be transient. So here's an example from the manual. At three minutes, you kind of see a little cloud-like retention, perceptible at the 10 minutes, but by 20 minutes, it kind of goes away. So even if you see this in a transient fashion, this counts as an LRM feature. This is sufficient for LRM. So why targetoid? We're kind of really focusing on targetoid. Well, it comes from the concept that these lesions and the LRM features that we're talking about primarily reflect cholangiocarcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma tends to have peripheral cellularity. So the cellular constituents demonstrate in the periphery, the arterial phase hyper enhancement and washout potentially, whereas the center of the lesion tends to have more necrosis and fibrosis. And that's where we get that trapping of contrast. And that's where we get um, on diffusion that the center of the lesion restricts less than the periphery where there's higher cellularity. So how about these non-targetoid LRM features? I mentioned them before, and I think the important take home point here is to keep in mind that we apply these to lesions or observations that do not meet TIV and do not meet LR5 criteria. So these tumors tend to be infiltrative in appearance, marked diffusion restriction, and necrotic or demonstrate areas of severe ischemia. So let's look at what this appears on imaging. So here's an example of a mass in the posterior liver that clearly does not meet LR5 criteria. We're not seeing a classic pattern of arterial phase hyperenhancement and washout here, but what we do see is this marked diffusion restriction. This is a tough lesion, but because of this feature and the non-LR5 criteria, this was classified as an LRM and on biopsy was a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Non-targetoid LRM feature also includes infiltrative appearance. So these can be those serotomimetic or infiltrative HCCs. These can be seen in the presence of TIV, but also you may see it without associated TIV. When you see it without associated TIV and the lesion does not meet LR5 criteria, that is, does not demonstrate arterial phase hyperenhancement, washout, or capsule, it may fall into the LRM category because of its infiltrative appearance. So this will be low signal on hepatobiliary phase imaging, restricted diffusion. Often this tends to be in sort of a segmental or a low bar distribution. Necrosis or ischemia, I think it's a bit of a tough concept uh, when you try to talk about what this looks like on imaging. Probably the best thing to think of is that these are areas that will not enhance. So these are areas that never pick up contrast on the imaging. And again, this feature should be applied to lesions and they should be called LRM if they do not meet LR5 criteria. Other features, I mentioned that we leave some things up to your discretion. So as a radiologist, we know that some things may make us think of non-HCC malignancy. Uh, again, oftentimes we're still talking about kind of cholangiocarcinoma features. So if you've got biliary duct dilation, this would be kind of a, an advanced clot skin tumor with a mass forming component. This is a cholangiocarcinoma, LRM, if this patient had risk factors. Here's another example. This is an intrahepatic mass forming cholangiocarcinoma with some capsular retraction, peripheral biliary duct dilation. Here's a nice lesion as well with some capsular retraction, another cholangiocarcinoma. So you've heard me mention cholangiocarcinoma, but I think it's important to consider what uh, kinds of lesions or what kinds of pathologies fall into the LRM observation category. So of course, cholangiocarcinoma is probably going to be the most frequently encountered non-HCC malignancy that will be LRM. Combined tumors, such as the cholangio, uh, hepatocellular cholangiocarcinomas, also often fall into this category, demonstrating at least some components of targetoid enhancement, restriction, or hepatobiliary phase appearance. Metastatic disease, especially from adenocarcinomas, the pattern of peripheral or rim AFI with peripheral washout is sort of a classic feature of an adenocarcinoma. Atypical HCCs, we'll go over some of these. These are important to keep in mind because you'll hear me say later 
that about a third of LRM are in fact atypical HCCs. And then we have some rare other entities to keep in mind, like other malignancies such as lymphoma, sarcoma. Rarely you're going to encounter benign lesions, sclerosis, hemangiomas, or potentially abscess need to be considered as well. So we've already talked about mass-forming cholangial carcinomas. Uh, these are going to be a rarer version of cholangial carcinoma. Most cholangios that you're going to see are going to be more the periductal infiltrating type. Uh, the mass forming is only about 20% of all cholangial carcinomas. These tend to arise from the second order bile ducts or smaller. And again, they have that targetoid appearance. Here you have multiple lesions in this liver, but these would be LRM. Just more examples of cholangial carcinoma, nice rim athy, really robust accumulation of contrast is central delayed enhancement. Uh, there have been some reports in the literature of central dark T2 signal, almost a targetoid appearance on T2 in addition to DWI uh, can be helpful for identifying intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma. Combined tumors. So these are tricky. These can be LR5. If we look at the literature, a minority of combined tumors actually have uh, LR5 features. But more commonly, what we're going to see with these combined tumors are that they are, in fact, LRM. Here's a nice example of rim AFI, peripheral washout. And here you can see this is darker than on the later phase. This is accumulating contrast, sort of that central delayed enhancement. Here's a nice another example with a beautiful targetoid appearance. This is a combined tumor. You can see just very pretty targetoid appearance on the hepatobiliary phase. I mentioned some benign lesions, so keep in mind, uh, especially if you've got a patient with a biliary enteric anastomosis or some intervention that would put them at risk, uh, abscess oftentimes can present with sort of a rim affy appearance and necrosis. And I think most importantly to keep in mind is that there are atypical HCCs that will be classified as LRM. So here's an example of one that has some hemorrhage in the middle, kind of bright on the pre-contrast imaging, which does not enhance centrally, but gives us this rim affy, biopsy proven HCC. Here's another one that has sort of a rim affy appearance, progressively enhancing another biopsy proven HCC. Here's a case example from Dr. Cherniak, kind of a cool, this is a new designation according to the WHO fifth edition, lymphocyte rich HCC. Uh, we don't have enough literature to know what these look like typically, but this lesion was an HCC, this category, but did not demonstrate those classic features. So this was in fact, this would have been an LRM lesion, but on biopsy was an HCC. A systematic review uh, from Dr. Vanderpool, published in Gastroenterology in 2018, is a great resource to understand what the categories in LIRADS reflect. And if you look at the LRM category, we see that, as I mentioned, about a third of LRMs are in fact HCC. But importantly, the vast, vast, vast majority, so almost 100% of these are malignant. So very rarely are you going to have benign lesions categorized as LRM. The take home point, though, is that LRM does not exclude HCC. So it's often going to be relevant, especially if the patient is potentially a transplant candidate to perform a biopsy to establish that diagnosis. So beyond making the diagnosis, let's talk just very briefly about prognosis. And this is an area of future development and interest. And this is the concept that we have these radiological phenotypes right? So a LIRADS category could be considered a phenotype of disease. And so beyond predicting the diagnosis, can we have any prognostic information derived from these categories? And I wouldn't be asking the question if the answer were no. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I showed you one subtype, lymphocyte-rich HCC. So according to the fifth edition, which was just published uh, last year, WHO classification now recognizes conventional HCC, that's our classic LR5 HCC, plus eight additional subtypes. And these subtypes are kind of cool. Uh, three of these subtypes are associated with a poor prognosis. So these are things that you might get the biopsy back and it says HCC, 
but it may be a really bad actor, perhaps uh, rapidly progressive, the patient has metastatic disease, does not do well. Uh, these poor prognostic subtypes are the macrotrabecular massive, scurus, and neutrophil rich. So these, we don't have a ton of literature about what they look like. There's one paper that uh, is either already published or coming out in radiology that describes the macrotrabecular massive subtype. These were sort of split between LR5 and LRM. They have a lot of necrosis. So sort of massive necrosis, greater than 20% of the lesion demonstrates necrosis. These patients tend to do very poorly. Scirus have been reported to show delayed enhancement. Uh, a lot of fibrous component to these tumors. And these would also, because of the delayed enhancement, oftentimes meet LRM uh, criteria. Neutrophil rich, we don't really have much in the way of literature on the imaging appearance, uh, but stay tuned. It's possible that's still coming. So this was an interesting paper and really gets uh, drives to the point of LRM as a prognostic factor. So this paper looked at HCCs, combined tumors, and cholangiocarcinomas, and looked, uh, here you have a Kaplan-Meier curve showing overall survival in these patients. And they took uh, a breakdown. So the cholangiocarcinoma or hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma combined tumors, they divided them by whether they had LRM versus LR4 or 5 appearance. And it was very fascinating to find out that those with the 4 or 5 appearance, those that looked more like a classic HCC, actually did quite a lot better. This is the purple line here, demonstrating overall surveillance, which was significantly different than those that had the LRM appearance. So that provides some evidence that LRM may in fact be prognostic, even if you're dealing with the same underlying pathology. Adding to that, another paper demonstrated that patients who underwent surgical resection for HCC, if that HCC was classified by imaging as an LRM, those patients did relatively poorly compared to the patients who had LR5 HCCs. I'm gonna skip past that just in the interest of time. So what are we getting at here? Uh, you know, if on pathology, these are all HCCs, uh, you know, why are they doing differently if they're LRM versus not LRM? So we have to think about the mutational landscape and carcinogenesis pathway within the liver. Dr. Cherniak talked about that a little bit yesterday, uh, very eloquently described how the cells of origin of these tumors can be different. And some HCCs can come from progenitor cells or have stem cell-ness to them. Those tend to do very poorly. They tend to be sort of more poorly differentiated and not uh, behave biologically as well as those that arise from hepatocytes. We also can see that there's some molecular interplay here, like CK19 positive, HCC. So CK19 is typically associated with cholangiocarcinoma. So these aren't uh, biphenotypic tumors, but an HCC that may have some cholangiocarcinoma feature or overlap in terms of its mutations will do worse than an HCC that doesn't. So all of these subsets here have been in the literature described as showing LRM features. So it's possible that when we have an LRM lesion, we're sort of picking out the bad HCCs if it comes back as HCC on pathology. So I'm gonna take this point to summarize here. Uh, we've covered a lot of material. Keep in mind that LRM is malignant, but not specific for HCC. And this comes early in the diagnostic pathway. So right off the bat, when you've got a malignant appearing lesion, you're gonna start asking yourself, is there rim AFI or non-rim AFI? And this is going to be before you get to that diagnostic table, you're gonna be thinking about the targetoid features and features such as necrosis and infiltrative appearance. Keep in mind that most LRMs are in fact non-HCC malignancies, the majority comprised of cholangiocarcinoma, but about a third of them are in fact HCCs, kind of atypical HCCs that we went over a little bit earlier. As I just mentioned, these features of LRM may be helping us to pick out some of these bad actors, and this could be, in fact, a nice sort of prognostic radiologic phenotype for HCC. And a final reminder that all of the LIRADS content can be found online for free 
Uh, you can download the manual, it's 16 chapters. We have a lot of discussion of these imaging features. Uh, so I really encourage you guys to check that out uh, if at all possible. And with that, I end. So call it, I don't know if you wanna moderate with some questions. I just found that I was muted, <laughs> following my own instructions. See guys, I'm following my own instructions. So what an outstanding lecture. Thank you very, very much, Katie, for this uh, great talk. I mean, it was very informative and uh, it, it's so exciting to listen to LRM from you. It's like you have in-depth understanding of what this means. And and I'm sure that if we give, if we give you three hours, you'd still be you know, covering materials in LRM in these three hours, correct? Um, yeah, but I don't think anyone would sign up for that, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> that I know like that you still, you probably, uh, you know, still have some exercises to do, some workouts, some hiking, some stuff to do some exciting. So I'm not gonna make you wait here for three hours. No worries about that. Um, we have very, um, Interesting questions uh, already asked. So, after thank you very much.